this is the fourth time that you've been on our um, podcast. You're the record holder. Mm-hmm. Just like in writing books, we should put this into the chat. <laughs> yes. Somebody's keeping score. <laughs> Me. Yeah, you're definitely over 30 books now. Like, definitely. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay. When I was training with the Concordia University cross-country team, the coach would occasionally confiscate our watches. Sometimes he would tell us to run a 400 meter at any effort and then guess what our pace is. Or other times he would prescribe a pace and then he would have us try and run that pace without our watches. This was mostly before I owned a GPS watch since I started running with Concordia in 2009 and GPS watches were not common. They also looked like small laptops, had terrible battery life, and required you to sell your car to be able to buy one. Okay, that part was a bit of an exaggeration. Even though it was not common to run with GPS, I had a watch with a timer and was used to having that feedback, so it was always strange to uh, have that taken away. At the time, I didn't like these workouts. I think part of me thought I was missing out on something important if I got the pace wrong because I didn't have my watch. But in today's book, we'll find out that working on our intrinsic pacing ability is how we will get the most out of ourselves. So hi, and welcome to the Running Book Reviews podcast, where we review running books to help you decide if you'd like to read the book for yourself. We also hope that listening to us chat about running can help keep you motivated about your own running, or maybe inspire you to try something new. My name is Liz, and with my co-host Alan, we're going to talk with author Matt Fitzgerald about his most recent book, On Pace. On Pace is Matt Fitzgerald's most recent book. At least I think it's his most recent book. He writes books so fast. He may have written another one since since we we last spoke about this, but this is a brand new book, so I I doubt it. This is where he really delves into pacing. Talks about the importance of pacing to get the most out of yourselves, how good the pros are at pacing, why the rest of us are maybe not quite so good, and how we can get better. There there are eight chapters. I'll just take a minute and read you the headings. Why pacing matters. Chapter two, the science of pacing. Chapter three, why you suck at pacing. Chapter four, pacing as self-regulation. Then the mind of a pacing master, pacing in training, pacing in competition. Last chapter eight, macro pacing, something we don't always think about. In fact, I lie when I say there are eight chapters because there are four extra chapters on the end which are four sets of training plans for the 5K, 10K, half marathon, and and marathon. Um, We'll probably talk about that too when we get to it at the end um, because they have some particular traits in them that we don't always see in training programs because this book's about pacing. You newbies who, who don't know much about Matt Fitzgerald, let me tell you a bit about Matt. If this is a new piece of information for you, um, shame on you. You haven't been listening to Running Book Reviews podcast because this is, I think, Matt's fourth time on this podcast. We covered his books, uh, Running the Dream, Run Like a Pro Even If You're Slow, and uh, The Comeback Quotient. On Pace is, a, once again, a different take on a different subject. Um, let me tell you about Matt. Matt Fitzgerald is a lifelong runner and endurance athlete. Um, He's an acclaimed sports writer and has authored and co-authored more than 30 books. He's a journalist who has written for many sports journals. So if you can think of a sports journal, Matt's probably written for it and some websites. Matt is also a running and triathlon coach and certified sports nutritionist. He has a website called mattfitzgerald.org and is co-founder of the 8020 Endurance Training website. New on his resume since we last spoken, Matt has now also founded a publishing house called 8020 Publishing. And I think On Pace is the first book from the new publishing house, 8020 Publishing. Welcome, Matt. Great to be back. Was, was I more or less factually correct with that spiel? Uh, I think you were 100% factually correct. That's good. Great, including that On Pace is the first book published by 8020 yep. Publishing. Very Great. exciting. Yeah. Good stuff. So. Um, 
yeah, if you wanted to talk uh, talk about what else you're going to be publishing, then um, you can definitely throw that in there. But I guess if we're going to talk about On Pace, um, a whole book about pacing. So how did you decide to write this book? Uh, the subject fascinates me. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a total geek for running. And, um, you know, as an athlete, a coach, kind of a student of the sport. And, and pacing is, you know, everyone, every runner understands essentially what it is and you know that it's a skill that is you know part of the sport but I, I don't think um many runners really reflect deeply uh, on like how pacing works um you know the science and the art of it um, and there's really a lot there you know for for me you know I guess you know I'll, I'll get to the second reason I wrote the book which is that um you know since I started running in 1983 back then runners didn't really talk about pacing much. And, and in my experience, just having been involved in the sport so long is that runners are actually by and large getting worse at pacing. And I think it's a function largely of a lot of runners are starting the sport later in life. And there's really no, no shortcut to experience in terms of getting better at pacing. And then, um, you know, to your intro story, uh, the, the devices um, uh, that we depend on to pace for us are sort of slowing our development of pacing skill. So, you know, I felt that there was just, you know, as a coach, it's a big point of emphasis um, in, in my coaching work um, to just help help runners get better um, at pacing. Cause it's sort of like free free performance. It's just, it's right there um, to be to be had if, if, if you choose to. But, you know, for me, like, you know, in addition to when I write a book, you know, it's, yes, it's supposed to have some practical benefit to, to runners. But also, like you know, I'm a big reader myself, so I I write books that I think are interesting. Um, and, and for me, like pacing is is just, you know, it's like um, this entry point point that allows you to explore the whole sport from a different perspective and actually just like understand running more deeply than you did before just by taking a deep dive in, into pacing. You, you, I noticed you said, you know all the devices that we have kind of contribute to making our pacing ability worse. Which is a shame because I like those devices. <laughs> Isn't there, look, just, just an aside, um, when, when you're looking at your watch and you're going, oh, how do I get the uh, watch to tell me what my last run splits were? Liz grabs your, grabs your wrist, starts hammering on your watch. Um, she's like the, the the little kid or the with the technology you know you, you right. don't know how to work it so you ask the youngest person in the room this yep. is this is that with the, that's an aside but i just want to uh, call her out um <laughs> i also i read the instructions that come with the watch which most people don't and you do, go but... through every screen on the darn <laughs> thing um wh what i was trying to ask was um how, how come having the watches makes your inherent pacing ability worse because you've got more data um yeah. you don't have to wait till you get home to know how quick you ran you can go okay <laughs> i'm kind of running at this pace what's that oh it's you can look at your watch and you know what it is so in theory it should give you more help shouldn't it Yes, um, but any tool can be, become a crutch, um, and this is true of you know not just you know GPS watches, but any type of, of tool. Um, you know the the example I like to give is spell check. Um, you know I'm a professional writer, an above average speller. So is my dad, and I remember talking to him one day, and we both agreed that since the advent of spell check, we've both become worse at spelling. Um, and uh, neuroscientists refer to this phenomenon as cognitive offloading. You know, it's like our, it, it's use it or lose it. Like our brains are as lazy as any other organ in, in our body. So if you're if if you allow your mind to become dependent on an external tool, then it will actually create a okay. dependency so that you can't do it without the help of that that device. Um, now I, I will say, like used correctly. Um, De devices have the potential to accelerate pacing skill development, but most of us don't, you know, intuitively know how to use them in, in, in that way. So maybe along the same lines, is there a way we should be using them? Because I, I do notice that, you know, sometimes you're running, like we run in a, a in a little pack and um, 
you know, in our little training group, and you'll have the person that keeps looking at their watch like throughout. And then sometimes like they get ahead and then they come back to the group and then they get ahead because they're looking at the instantaneous pace. Um, or sometimes we'll have the strategy. Well, we'll only look at every K, like when the K buzzes, then we'll check what the pace was for the last K. Is there, an, is there a way that's better to use the watch than other ways? Yes, definitely. Um, you know, you, you know, there's been in, some interesting research done on this subject about how runners actually do use their devices. And, you know, there's like, there's a trajectory, you know, you know there's like, it's like, the, the, you know, one study I'm thinking of, they identified three phases of device usage and, and not every runner gets to phase three, but that's, that's where you want to get to. You know, the first is sort of an exploration phase where you're just, uh, you know, like you reading the instructions, playing around with it, um, you know, just trying things out. Then there's kind of a consolidation phase when you start to be able to use uh, select features in, in kind of a more purposeful way. And then there's a pruning phase where you just, um, you know, that third and final phase, which is like advanced uh, use of, of your device where you're just ignoring almost all of it. And, and you, you're really in the driver's seat, like you are the boss of your device. So you're, you're still using it, you're still making use of it, um, but um, you are very much in control. You know exactly when and how to use it and you're not overusing it. I, I guess I jumped straight to phase three because I never work out how to use it properly. And I, <laughs> 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 I jumped straight to the pruned version where it just tells you what was on the original watch face that you <laughs> that yes. it, it had when you bought it. Um, and occasionally I get Liz to show me how to do something sophisticated, like actually tell me what a lap is on it or something like that. Like the day that I showed you how to input your workouts. I mean, that's a game changer. It like is, you can pre-program yeah. your, your workouts. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah I've stopped doing it because it's too much hassle <laughs> or, or actually prefer to think of myself as a, an advanced user of the watch. You see, I've pruned that mm. out of my, okay. of my use. I guess I should be learning from you instead of the other way around. <laughs> One of the beautiful examples that you um, that you start in at the book with um, of pacing, which was a fantastic choice that you made from from my opinion anyway, was um, Bekele's effort at uh, Kenanisa Bekele's effort at the uh, Berlin Marathon 2019, uh, I think. Um, yeah, where where you basically just describe how he he rings every last second out of his performance at an elite level by on occasions deliberately not following people who were surging he, he was he was in third place quite late on in the race mm -hmm. and i'd kind of given him up when i was watching live i don't, I don't know how you felt about it but i thought mm, it's not his day you know he's yep. he's had a go but uh he's getting old and what do you expect <laughs> um he's still running extremely fast but no he'd actually paced himself perfectly and was able to keep cranking it up. Marathons at elite levels are sort of famous for the person who slows down the least towards the end wins. And Bekele sort of demonstrates that superbly well. Um, and, and you describe it um, superbly well. And I think everybody, this is, there's a question in this and it's coming at the end. I think everybody um, <laughs> kind of can see that. You know, you can you can look at it and go, wow, that's 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 incredibly good. But on the cover of your book is a picture of a different kind of performance, which is um, Yuki Kawachi. Uh, I hope that's the, I haven't murdered the pronunciation, but Yuki, the Japanese uh, guy, winning Boston 2018 in the rain, where in fact when he ran the race, he didn't run a, an even split at all he seemed to surge and slow and surge and slow but you actually put him on the cover of the book versus mm -hmm. versus Bekele who is what, what would I say everybody's sort of more or less ideal of a, of a pacer even absolutely even right across and, and cranking every second out of it so what, why is Yuki Kawachi uh, for people who don't know in in Boston 2018 he surged to the front he took the lead for uh early on for for a good while um he then got caught up by people but he then surged again and he proceeded to 
correct me if I'm wrong, Mike, but he proceeded to surge like numerous times. Yep. Um, so, so how come he's an example of good pacing? Yeah. So, you know, those are two different uh, ways of pacing in, in the chapter of the book uh, called uh, pacing and competition. I, I make a distinction between pacing for time, which is what 99% of recreational runners do. It's like, you know, running your own race, you're just trying to PR or achieve a certain time goal versus pacing for position or pacing to win, which is really what most of the pros are doing most of the time. They're trying to win and they're less concerned about their time, especially at, at a race like Boston, especially in atrocious weather conditions. So Yuki didn't run, uh, he, he didn't come to Boston to PR, he came to win. And he had, um, he, he knew what the weather was gonna be like. He knew who his competition was. Uh, he ran the course ahead of time and he had a plan and the, and you know, any good pacing performance makes some allowance for spontaneous adjustments. You can't just, you know, blueprint your performance as if there are gonna be no surprises or, or any unexpected um, occurrences within the race itself. So you, know, you need a, a plan with some flexibility and that's exactly what Yuki did. He, he, wanted, to, um, he wanted to frustrate his competition um, he wanted to keep the pace honest, um, but he didn't want to work any harder than necessary in, in doing so. So that is why he he started off at a at a fast pace just to ensure that that, that everyone was working hard. And then he backed off uh, once he saw that he had succeeded in that and allowed other people to do more of the work and tucked in the pack. As soon as the pace started slowing down, he surged again to re-inject some pace into it to make sure that it was hard and frustrating for his competitors. And he just, he controlled the race from start to finish. I mean, he, he made, there may have been moments when he wasn't sure he was going to win, but that's, um, you know, it's a very different way of masterfully executing a race pacing performance than, you know, the, the dead even splitting from start to finish of a marathon thing. So um, another story that you told in the book was actually a story you had read in uh, Out of Thin Air by Michael Crawley. And that was when Michael went to Ethiopia and he meets this runner on one of the first days uh, that turns out to be like an elite pacer. And the runner says, um, what pace do you want to run? And he says, he just kind of thought, oh, I'll just shrug him off. Like I'll say four minutes per kilometer. And so they start out and he ends up running exactly four minutes per kilometer, but he wasn't wearing a GPS watch. Like the point of that story was basically, you know, that elite runners have this, just this intrinsic knowledge of pace, but do they, do you think they start with the intrinsic knowledge of pace and that's why they become elite or is it all the running experience on their way to becoming elite that gives them that knowledge? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, you know, no matter who, I'm, I'll say this, um, like any other skill, pacing skill is partly innate and partly learned. So there are some people who, you know, just have a bit of a knack for it, but like nobody comes out of the box <laughs> as a masterful pacer. Like everyone is dependent on experience to some degree or another, which is good news for those of us who, who don't really have a knack, which means, you know, we, we can all improve and all the more so with some intentionality. Um, you know, pe people, runners who like do have a gift for it, you know, what, what, what that, in, in the book, I talk about three pillars, um, three traits that really underlie pacing skill, their body awareness, judgment, and toughness. And if you think about those three traits, independent of pacing, you can see they're all very important, <laughs> you know, to being a successful runner. So, you know, just, you know, if you even forget about, because we, there's a tendency to think about pacing as just a skill, but it's a skill that is, um, you know, informed by some underlying psychology. And I think that that underlying psychology is some of the stuff that you kind of have to have um, to be an elite runner. Like you have to have great body awareness. Um, you have to be uh, very tough and you have to have good judgment. You have to make good decisions um, as a runner. Um, so, you know, in that sense, you know, not everyone is equally tough or equally body aware, uh, but we can all get better. So how does, uh, because we're talking about toughness. So like, we know that you can, you know, you can become a, a tougher runner, but how does that help with your pacing? Yeah. So, um, great question. Um, 
you know, I define pacing as the art of finding your limit. And in endurance running, your limit is the, the only limit you, you ever really encounter unless you like, you know, suffer from exertional heat exhaustion or, or something in race is, is psychological, not physical. Like in a, you know, a 60 meter dash a sprint, you're running as hard as you can from the blocks to the finish line. There is no pacing and your limiter is purely physical. It's how fast you can turn over your legs and how much force, directional force you can apply to the ground. That's it, that's all, end of story. In any type of race that is long enough that the, the quickest way to finish is actually not to run as quick as you can until you're almost finished. The, anything that's long enough to be paced there, the, the, the limits you encounter are actually psychological. It's not as if your physical limits disappear, but it, you know, research has shown that human beings are incapable of staining a, ma a truly maximal effort longer than 30 to 45 seconds. So you, you absolutely have to hold back. And, and the way you hold back is by feel. Just you're sort of listening to your body and using experience and using your conscious knowledge of how long the race is and how far into it you are to just sort of guess, <laughs> you know, how, how fast you can go without uh, hit, hitting the wall uh, before the end. So because the limit is really perceptual, it's not, it, it's movable. Um, you know, for example, if, you know, you know, plenty of studies have shown that, um, it, you know, if, if runners are asked to run a solo time trial and then race the same distance in a group, they'll run faster in the group. Mm -hmm. Well, there's nothing physically different between those situations. It's mm -hmm. purely just that the, you, you know, the, we're social animals and we feed off our competitive instincts and that's why you can go faster. So, you know, just the presence of competitors moves back uh, your, your limit. So you, now you can see why toughness is important to pacing because like you, you need, you know, that, that last step to your limit is painful and you have to be tough to be willing to take that step. And the tougher you are, the further back you can actually push your limit, or you can sort of compress the different the distance between your perceptual and your actual physiological limit to get closer and closer to the cliff. That makes a lot of sense because I feel like when I race, sometimes I can hurt so much more, but I can't do that. Like, let's say day in, day out, every day of practice, right. like I'm just not able to. And then also I like it just feels like, you know, you run a 5k and you do a certain time, but then you're trying to do like 800s at your 5k pace and they feel so hard in workouts, yeah. but you yep. get a break in between each 800. So it doesn't right. really make sense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, now it does make sense. <laughs> Let me just be sure um, our listeners understand what we're saying here, because what, what you say in your book and what you're saying here basically is that when you think you're completely exhausted at the end of a run your brain has lied to you in fact it's your brain that stops you not for endurance runs not some something in your physiology so it's not your cardiovascular system it's not your oxygen uptake it's not your your muscle atp exchange your brain is messing with you i, I would put it slightly differently like it, the way you articulate it is the way tim noakes would um, but I'm, I'm more of a Sam Wellamarcora guy, it's a <laughs> psychobiological model versus the central governor theory. And, and what Marcora yeah. would say is it's a choice. It's not your brain tricking you. It's you making a conscious choice to quit or to slow down. It doesn't always feel like it. It's just, you know, cause everyone, you know, everyone has their limit to how much discomfort they're willing to tolerate. And, you know, and the wrinkle in, in um, any type of race where it's, you know, you're, you're competing over a, a known distance and you're, you're, you are self-pacing, you are at every step of the way, you're deciding how fast to go. You know, it, it's, it's tempting, and I, I'm guilty of this myself, to say that, you know, the goal of pacing is to finish in the least amount of time possible, but you actually have two goals. And the first one, is to finish, period. <laughs> so because, because the first goal is to make sure you finish and the second is to finish in the least time possible, there's like everyone is sort of like optimal pacing is actually inherently conservative. Like you're making sure you can finish and then opening up the throttle, you know, when you're within sight of the finish line. And all this is just simply done perceptually. And, and so 
when you mess up, like, you know, me and, you know, in all too many of the marathons and ultra marathons I ran when I just felt like, you know, I was inexorably just slowing down and it didn't feel like it was a choice. That's a choice. That's where you've just simply miscalculated. And by the time you reach, you know, your maximal tolerance for discomfort, you're, you're far enough for the finish line where it's just not worth it. You know, you, you just decide, no, I'm walking. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. I was, I was, Deliberately doing the no central governor uh, position right. mainly because yep. that's the one I know. So um, <laughs> it's I also I, I find it hard to accept that I'm making a choice not to do the hard thing, and I'm a bit scared about our upcoming uh, three-hour marathon attempt um, because it might get extremely, extremely difficult. It's right on the limit of what we could ambition to do, and it might get extremely difficult at the end. I got no problem with it being really tough and being too tough and maybe not being able to um, achieve it and, and just, just miss out. Maybe I've kind of got a problem with the idea that I would choose to do that. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it might, it might in fact be impossible for you to run a sub three hour marathon currently. Um, and if it is, you'll, you'll find out. Yeah, but it isn't. Yes. Well, uh, you know, be that as it may, like, you know, <laughs> I mean, that that is how pacing works like it's going to be extremely extremely like, extremely extremely difficult it's not going to be yes. impossible yeah so i mean th- that is it, it that, that is simply how pacing works um you're you're just and, and you and you sort of know it yeah. like i mean when when you're one mile into that three up sub three hour marathon attempt who's deciding how fast you're running one mile into it you are <laughs> and the same thing at two miles and the same thing when you hit the wall at 25 miles <laughs> Like it's you, it's you deciding how fast you're running. Yeah. And that's actually, that's a a good, a good scenario hitting the wall at 25 miles because I've hit the wall much earlier. (laughs) Yeah, me too. (laughs) What's the earliest you've ever hit the wall? I might have Uh, you beat. 15K. Ottawa Marathon 2016, 15K. I don't know what happened. I just couldn't. I had nothing in my legs. And that was the longest. That was the longest second more than half marathon that I've ever done in my life. Oh, wow. It was so long. I lost that one. Uh, 20K oh, okay. for me. I, I, I bought oh, okay. a 20K Okay, Okay, well, that's year. pretty pretty similar. It, that's a lot. It's a long way to go when you yeah. bought a 20K. Yes. I bought a 25K when uh, I tried to do a pace, which was ridiculous for the heat and humidity. I kind of ignored that. I said I can run fast and ignored the conditions. And that was very disappointing. <laughs> Okay, now we've scared everybody with all the talk of being tough and uh, uh, grinding it out and hitting the wall. Let me rewind a little bit to another one of the three factors that you were talking about. You talked about um, good judgment or cultivating judgment in that section. You talk about attentional focus. So where do you, when you're running and you're making judgment calls, where do you put your focus? Where do you focus yourself? And, And you talk about internal versus external are you focusing inside versus outside? And I think you talk also about intentional versus unintentional or some some term like that, um, where you deliberately choose to focus somewhere yep. versus yep. Somebody, else versus somebody else chooses. Somebody else chooses. I think I think you said somebody calls to you from the from the yep. sidelines and you turn your head. You don't didn't really mean to do that, you just did it. Mm-hmm. So to talk to us a bit about how do we cultivate good attentional focus when, when we're running and, and what are some of the do's and don'ts about where to put your attention when you're running endurance? Yes, um, you know, there, there's actually a, a surprising or it might be surprising to some listeners amount of science on the role of, of attentional focus in, in endurance performance. So uh, we, we, we know a lot I- I- empirically. Generally speaking, you're better off being mostly outwardly focused uh, you know when we focus too much internally we're just we almost amplify our discomfort um, and that is our instinct right when we start to hurt we start to think about how much we're hurting and that actually mm-hmm. actually makes it worse so gen- I mean obviously you, you need to be listening to your body that's part of it too but it's a little bit it should be a little bit in the background and you're focused more on performance relevant external stimuli and also on the interface between your body and the environment. And that's true in any sport. Um, for example, there, in, in basketball, there was a study done where um, subjects were asked to either focus on breaking their wrist, not breaking the wrist, but you know, like um, you know, finishing with the wrist when shooting free throws or just focusing on the back of the rim. 
and they were much more accurate when focusing on the back uh, of the rim versus um, breaking at the risk. Um, and so running is the same way. You just want to think about performance relevant stimuli out, outside your body for the most part. You, you also want to, you want your attentional focus to roam, but you don't want it to be scattered. Uh, there was a, 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 a great study done involving cyclists where they, they, um, they manipulated the, the variety of different sorts of feedback they had. So in one, they had like heart rate, uh, power, speed, distance a lot, you know, distance covered. And it was like five different things. And another one, they just had one. And they actually were able to finish a time trial faster when they just knew their, how far they had to go. Um, and also there was a similar study done with um, like uh, elite cyclists versus, uh, you know, amateur cyclists. And they had the same uh, feedback, but they were they actually tracked where their eyes went when performing a, a, a time trial. And the amateurs were much more scattered. They were just looking at everything because they weren't really sure. Whereas um, the elites tended to be laser focused on the stuff that they considered most important. So, um, and then, you know, your attention can also be on your emotions, um, you know, positive, negative and neutral. And, um, and that's where you have, you can't entirely control your emotions, but you have a certain amount of control and, um, you know, more, more expert pacers, more high performing, uh, runners, um, you know, tend to have, be good at sort of nipping negative emotions in the bud, uh, and cultivating positive emotions or, you know, positive affect, uh, while they're running. So, so things like, um, because I, I think like what we learn is, you know, that we should focus on ourselves when we're running a race, um, and not get, uh, too, you know, carried away with what other people are doing or how fast they're running, or if they're, you know, if they gapped us or those kinds of things. Um, but what you're saying is that it's, it's actually maybe that is what we should focus on with a limit instead of focusing, like, because I guess uh, in the absence of that, we'll, we'll try and think of other things to focus on, like form cues and things like that, but maybe too much of that is, is not good. Is, is that kind of what, uh, yeah. what do you think? Yes. Yeah. And, 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 and so, yeah, I mean, there's, uh, there's, uh, you know, research, you know, showing that people, they, they rate their own discomfort for perception of effort higher when their attention is focused internally. Runners are also less efficient when they're thinking because like, you know, it's just think about it. Like your brain is telling your, your body to move like it all. Your brain is a con control center for the entire running action. So you want your brain to be as quiet as possible. And this is something else that's true in all motorsports. Like if, if you find someone who's really, really good at, you know, hitting a golf ball or driving a race car, they actually have the least activity in their brains because they're able mm -hmm. to automate it. So that's why you don't wanna, like anything you can do automatically. And if you've been running for you know a number of years, you can pretty much run automatically and you can breathe automatically. So when you start thinking about these things, you're actually forcing your brain to work harder than it needs to. And you actually become measurably less efficient. So that's why you don't want to be too focused internally. You do wanna be reading your perception of effort and just sort of that, you know, that, that ever present question, is this sustainable? Is this sustainable? Like that, you, you don't want to turn that off. Um, and then in terms of like having your attention focus more outside, it's not just on anything. I mean, you, you definitely don't want to just be paying, only paying attention to the people around you, you know, who may have no idea what, what they're doing. Um, that's why I say, you know, performance relevant stimuli. So checking your pace, um, you know, putting a, a target on the back of a runner a, ahead of you. Um, or just you know keeping an eye out for the next aid station, um, uh, noting when there's a hill coming up, paying attention to the direction of the wind. Um, those sorts of things would be you know ways to ex externalize your attentional focus in ways that aid your performance. I, I guess what I do um, just based on experience is if I'm running a, a long race, I'll go through a form drill every let's say kilometer markers um, for a marathon. You know, when my watch buzzes to say you've finished another kilometer, check the pace, go through a form drill. So what sort of shape am I, am I in? Am I starting to slouch? Have I got my head up? Have I got my chest out? Have I got my shoulders down? Am I relaxed? Am I getting the most out of my form drill? Okay, switch. try and switch that. Adjust if you need to, but then switch that off. And yep. then go, okay, so that's, okay. I was, I was letting things slip a little bit there. 
I can be more efficient. Okay, reset and then switch it off and go external. And I tend, because I'm not a pro, I guess I'm not an elite. I tend to try to zone out a little bit. So I'll go, okay, there's a, there's a marker up there or there's a, there's a guy up there. Just notice him. A little bit of sort of pseudo meditation. Just notice that person and we're gradually creeping up on them. Just notice them. Don't, don't activate. Don't do, don't react. Just notice them. And the, the idea of that is not to chase the guy. Don't put a marker on and chase him down. It's to switch my brain off. Mm-hmm. It's really just trying to say, you don't have anything to do for the next, let's say, minute. We're on a straight line. We're not going to turn a corner. The wind's not going to change. You're not going to get any more tired. You don't need to take any notice of any of your muscles. Are, are there good things in there or, or bad things? Uh, that sounded all good to me, okay. um, for sure. Okay. Like those, yeah, those little, um, those little audits uh, of your of your form. You know, I think you know you probably landed on that for a reason. You know, does every runner do it? Nope. Um, but you know it. You know, it probably works for you. Um, well, because my form's terrible, and yeah, when we <laughs> and when we when we did uh, what was the book we did? Uh, uh, there were a few um, of them. We did a book um, on on form running, and we videoed, uh, videoed ourselves. And I just look around us. So <laughs> <laughs> since then, I, lo- I look like I'm auditioning for the role of Quasimodo. In uh, <laughs> <laughs> we're all our own harshest critics <laughs> there <you go>. sure. <laughs> i guess uh maybe now we can talk about uh like the rate of perceived effort and um training by effort instead of by pace because uh then at the end of the book you have some training plans and they're they're all effort based so uh first of all i guess i think most runners know about the 1 to 10 scale of of um rate of perceived uh, effort but maybe you want to define the the levels a little bit more like uh like you know like what would a a, t- a tempo pace be equivalent to uh, what's yep. uh you know, what's a 5k, the VO2 max effort. Yes. Um, yeah. It, one thing I learned and, you know, because there's, there's some research um, where, you know, they look for like physiological correlates to perceived effort ratings. Um, so they try to, the trouble is with those studies, they report averages. So it makes it look really reliable. It's like, oh, mm-hmm. you know, like, you know, like, you know, an RPE of six correlated highly with lactate threshold. But that was the average. And one thing I learned when I started really focusing on, on pacing skill development in coaching is that, you know, there can be outliers. <laughs> and so like, you know, a five out of 10 does not mean the same thing to, to every runner. So in the book, I'm careful to say, you know, the, to, to, you know, give cues for calibrating RPE. Um, and those, you know, I just have and they are basically the ones that that would be the averages from from the research. So, you know, one is not exercise. Uh, one is you you and I talking here right now. Um, two would be like the your very easiest warm up. Uh, three would be sort of the high end of a warm up intensity or like an easy easy run pace. Four is the uh, the first ventilatory threshold. Um, and that's, that is technically where moderate intensity, once you're just above that 4.1, um, you're technically at a physiologically moderate intensity. Um, so you want basically for all your easy runs, anything that's supposed that, that is intent intended to be done at low intensity, you, you, you want your RPE to be four or lower, unless it's like a super long run and you're just getting tired. Cause our, that's the other thing that should, that should be said, like those are initial RPE ratings. Okay. Uh, so once you once you've been running just long enough to settle into the pace and get a read on your perceived effort, but but you're you're at any intensity, your RPE will gradually increase. You know, if you walk long enough, you'll hit RPE ten. You know, mm-hmm. after twelve hours or something, where you, it's like I can't take another step. Five would be like a steady state intensity. Um, like for a lot of people, it's kind of a marathon effort. Six is threshold. Seven would be. Um, would c- correspond to uh, the uh, uh, critical velocity, which is which is a, a, like a, a, a pace you could sustain or an intensity you could sustain for 20 to 30 minutes. So that's a seven initial RPE. Eight is uh, VO2 max. 
uh, intensity. So more like a, like a six minute effort. And then, you know, nine would be, um, you know, your interval pace and 10 is like an absolute all out sprint, or, I mean, it's how tired you are at exhaustion at any pace. Um, okay. Yeah. I'm glad that you specified that it's kind of like at the beginning of your effort, because, you know, with, um, with the previous club I was with, we actually, we would rate our workouts, uh, on a scale of one to 10. And I was had like, at, when I first started, I kind of had a hard time with that. Cause I was like, well, okay, but you know, like wh when am I rating this? Like, do you like at the beginning or is this like, if I was fresh, how would I feel in this workout? Or like, how am I, what am I doing with this? Like how, what kind of number am I supposed to put? And so it took some getting used to, and that was like always one of my questions is like, well, is the, the overall workout? Because let's say like, um, you know, sometimes uh, each individual, uh, let's say we were doing a progression long run, for example, by the end, I mean, I, I was completely exhausted, so I would have given it a 10, but it's like, it, it wasn't meant to be a 10, like not the whole thing was 10, like the first whatever half of it was at easy run pace and we were talking. So that wasn't 10, but at the end I was completely exhausted. So that was 10. So, so it's good. So the rate of, so let's say we're out on the track and we're going to do um, eight times, I don't know, eight times 800 at uh, 10 K pace. So what we want to do is rate kind of the first interval at the right rating and then try and continue at that speed, I guess. Yeah. And, and you, and you should end up back there after your recoveries, right? But it's just like, as you get deeper into the workout, you've completed more repetitions. Uh, you, you will, you'll sort of depart from that initial RP more quickly, like earlier within the rep. And I will also add, um, the, the, I don't, not all parts of all the runs in the training plans in my book are, are, are effort-based. There are, there are lots of circumstances where you do want to run by, by pace. Um, so it's not that you just, you know, throw away your, your garment and never pay attention to it ever again. Um, the RPE stuff is, is for certain types of runs and certain types of efforts. But, you know, if you're trying to do, um, you know, say you're, you're, you are training for a 10 K and you want to, um, run practice at your 10k goal pace well that's a pace that's not that's not an rpe there's an rpe attached to it and mm -hmm. and you know what what a, what a very skilled pacer will do is you know there's always a lag right when you start uh, um an, an interval you you're, you're going by feel i mean you simply are no matter how dependent you are in your, your watch like you know the first step two three four five before you can able can can your watch catches up you go, so you, you like you need to be able to do that, um, and and so yeah, whether you're you're keying off numbers or, or not, there, there's a role for RPE, but it's not it shouldn't be the only thing you ever use for any any type of workout. Yeah, I was just gonna ask how how you then um, transition to the pace. So let's say you're you know you're trying to improve your skill in pacing, so when would you, when would you like use RPE and then when would you use your watch or would you use both and then try and compare notes like at the end of the workout, but like try not to look at it for the workout. So how do you yep. usually do that? Yep. You should know what you're doing in, in, in each session. So, you know, for, for easy runs, which should be about 80% of what most of us are doing, like once you've calibrated your perceived effort against, um, you know, objective metrics like pace and heart rate, you should be able to do every easy run without relying on your device. And that's a that's a good chance. That's a good opportunity. You know, if you're one of those people who gets stuck in the moderate intensity rut and you're going too fast or easy days, then you need to calibrate first. But in easy runs, it, it, it's it's a good chance. It's a good opportunity because it's not. You're, you're not aiming for precision in, in those runs. Um, and because they, they take up so much of, of your, your running time, that it's a really good opportunity to, to, to learn to focus more uh, on your body. And I, I'm a big believer that your, your pace in easy runs should be all over the place. It should be very erratic, uh, especially from one run to another, but even within runs. Um, because it, it's it's a beautiful it's another op, it's, it's also an opportunity to fine tune your workload because um, no training plan is perfect but you you know you make a plan and you hope it's basically right um, but you're going to have to make adjustments 
the least disruptive adjustment to make is in the moment uh, effort adjustments in your easy runs because it's, again, it's 80% of your running. So if you learn, like my easy runs should always be comfortable, you know, given where I am uh, today. So if you're fresh and you're fit and you're in one of your purple prep patches, you might feel really good at a you know pretty brisk pace in your easy runs. You know, but if you just had like a, you know a brutal epic workout yesterday and you're you're doing a recovery run today, you might feel only feel relatively comfortable at a very slow slog. And you should you should actually use that so that y- your your easy run paces are exotic, exotic, um, erratic, um, exotic. Who knows? And then and then Ecstatic. and then you, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm peeking. Garvin says. Yes. <laughs> and then, but you know, there, then there's like all all kinds of other little like uh, you know ways you can sort of gamify um, or or add pacing challenges to different types of workouts. Um, so and and so there's a variety of them, and you should use the full toolkit because you you really accelerate your your learning of pacing skill by coming at it from a lot of different directions. Um, so I'll just toss out one example that is uh, precision splitting. So in that one, if you're doing um, uh, like a set, uh, let's go back to your example of 800 meter repeats on, on the track. Now, you know what your, your basic target is. It's, it's roughly 10K pace. So you run the first one and you get your time down to the hundredth of a second. And then assuming that you were within, like you, you executed properly and it was about the pace you were looking for, then you arbitrarily Try to hit exactly the same time for every sub- subsequent repetition down to the hundredth of a second, and it's just a way of getting you um, to to really be to more to be able to more um, granularly control your pace. And you know, a lot of you know, a lot of high school runners do do these games. They just come up with them uh, on their own. I did it, and you can get scary good at, at th- this kind of thing. And yeah, it's just kind of a fun way to gamify your training. But it is actually making you a, a better pacer, better at, at finding your limit uh, when it really matters. Yeah, I like the one. Uh, I like the one. I don't remember what you called it, but the one where you um, you put a sock at where you finished your interval, and then you try and go further the next time. I think yeah. like anybody that has ever run cross country in high school, they kind of will just like do that anyway. Like yeah. every time you'd have like several intervals to do, like up the hill. And you just try and get further each time. And, uh, you know, oftentimes like the coach was just there uh, with a whistle and he would blow the whistle and it's time to stop. And you'd be like yeah. trying to get those extra yeah. steps. <laughs> yeah. I think you call those stretch intervals. Yep. Oh, stretch intervals. Yep. And, and you uh, you saw us trying to gamify our uh, pacing uh, online. Yep. Trying to uh, run our. I guess a long run and get a straight flat piece of road as much as possible to give ourselves the best chance of getting a good result. Just not look at our watch. Very interestingly, not look at our watch, wait for it to beep and then say a number and look at it for the pace. Very, very interesting. We were on autopilot and looked at our watch before we said the number sometimes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because yeah. it's so intrinsic now. Yeah. So I say, okay, Liz, what's your guess? Oh, I've already looked at my watch. <laughs> uh, um, and, then, and then I did it after criticizing Liz for doing it. Uh, <laughs> because we're so, <laughs> because we're, so, we're so automatic. You watch buzzes and you just check it. Yeah. Yeah. You, know, you don't think about it. You know, this is actually a good opportunity for me to mention that, um, you know, most of these different pacing games that, that I teach in the book and encourage runners to incorporate into their training, one way or another, you will fail the first time you do it. And so that was just like your version of failing, you know, in, mm-hmm. in that game. And so you should just accept that. Like, it's okay. Like, you know, it, interestingly, I, I just happened to be reading uh, David Epstein's book, Range, now. And there's a chapter in there where he talks about, um, you know, the science of, of learning. And I wasn't aware of the research he talks about, but he, he was saying like, like basically the harder the learning process is the more effective it is long term so like if you mm-hmm. like if you're learning in a way that makes you feel like you're making rapid progress it actually isn't sticking <laughs> and, oh. and 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 so i thought well yeah shoot i wish i'd read range before i wrote on pace because <laughs> that that's sort of yeah i mean I, in the book i say um you know the the road to pacing mastery is paved with pacing errors um, so the errors mm. are good. Like you, you want mm. to mess up. Um, 
And that's why you want to do each of these things more than once, you know, so you can actually see that you are in fact making real lasting progress. We, we found out that Liz is actually great at calling a piss when she's running up a hill. Huh. Yeah, because I know, I know how terrible I am when I run up a hill, but I, I always underestimate my pace if I'm like flat or well, maybe not always, but like, anyway, I get it more wrong. Let's say yeah. <laughs> we were, we were about six seconds. Uh, we were sort of averaging about six seconds, something like that per K off, which is horrendous. So when you build it up over a whole distance, some of mine were quite a bit more than six seconds. Then I saw some information which says, you know, that's, that's not unusual. Quite a, quite a lot of people are off by at least that amount. That is correct. Probably saw it in your book, in fact. Uh, you might have seen it. I wrote a blog post about it recently. I, I um, Maybe, we, did, yeah. uh, we call it the 80-20 Endurance Pacing Challenge. Uh, so we, on Instagram and Twitter, invited people to... That's um, where I saw it. Yeah, oh. to run a, a kilometer or a mile at their most recent half marathon pace. Uh, you know, And then choose a time and then try to nail it without consulting your device and then report your results. And uh, I got one person was was dead on, uh, but only one. And, and yes, most were wide of the mark substantially. <laughs> yeah, I, I was definitely off by a yeah. lot in some cases, like 10 seconds, 12 seconds. I got one of my kilometers exactly on, but we had about 20 tries. <laughs> so, and it was all nearly all flat road. Yeah. So yeah, it requires some work, but if it's difficult, um, maybe that's better. That's what you're saying. Yes. Take heart. One of the things you touched on earlier, and one of the things we endurance racers always get into our mind is, can I sustain this pace that I'm running now till the end of the run? You know, if I can't, should I be adjusting, slowing up a bit so I don't blow up? And in interestingly, you say, if you ask yourself the question, can I sustain the race to this pace till the end of the race? Tell us that the correct answer to that question should be maybe. Yes. Please explain. Yes. Um, because you're really trying to thread a needle, you know, when you, when you're executing, you know, a, a, a pacing strategy for the race, um, you know, you, you want, you want to run exactly as fast as you can, you know, for not, not, you know, <laughs> for, for the full, for the full distance. Um, and so, and, and so perceptually the way that plays out, you know, if you're sort of riding that line is that you, you are not sure because think about it. Like, you know, if you're, you know, halfway through a 5k, 10k half marathon, whatever, and you are absolutely 100% sure that you can sustain that pace, then there's a very good chance that you will finish and know that you could have gone faster. You do not want to be 100% sure because you're very likely to be disappointed after the end. And the, the, the answer, of course, should should absolutely not be, no, definitely, I cannot sustain this race. <laughs> <laughs> so that goes without saying. So there's only one option left, maybe. And, 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 and I, I know what people are saying. Well, you know, maybe could, you know, that's a recipe for blowing up. Because if it's maybe halfway through, then it's almost certainly going to be no, you know, when you're a mile from the finish. But remember, you get to adjust at any point. So, you know, what, what the very skillful paper... Uh, pacers do is like you know they're they're running along and it's maybe 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 and as soon as the maybe starts to tilt a little too far in the direction of no they slow down <laughs> and and if they get deeper into it and the maybe turns into a probably they speed up and so like you 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 can you can course correct before it's too late you know like you you can you can make a different decision about your pacing at every single stride of the entire race. For for a marathon, Liz and I maybe maybe more me, but for a marathon, we have we have this approach which is we ignore the first half. So we're we're on a mission to try to run sub three if we can. Um, and it's 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 very much a maybe for us. We had a goal last year and failed. So we know, but we know it's in the envelope somewhere. So our approach is, well, we won't even ask ourselves the question until we get to halfway. We'll run the we'll run the required three hour pace to half distance because because you have to do that. It doesn't even enter our heads to start asking ourselves the question until we get over halfway. And then we can start to say, okay, how are we, how are we feeling with this pace? Now, we spoke with Paul Tonkinson about his, uh, during his book, 26.2 uh, Miles to Happiness, where he was basically on a mission to run under three hours. 
and he said to us, you might be uh, undercooking your initial, pe- your, your first half pace, because what we do is we try to run an absolute even split because we feel we have nothing to, we have nothing to spare. We have no margins. So we figure we're going to run the first half in 129.59, and we're going to run the second half in 130.000. Success. He said, you should, you're going to slow down towards the end. You should have a little bit of some seconds or a minute up your sleeve. Is this a good idea or is this theoretically a bad idea? Or am I throwing away some of my chance by trying to bank even a few seconds? Uh, it's the most unsatisfying answer someone can ever give on a podcast, but it, it depends. <laughs> it, it does depend. Of course it um, does. <laughs> You know, it, I'll, and here, here's why. This is a helpful way to explain it, I think. Um, you know, not every runner is the same, you know. So, like, there are, some, there are some general parameters that define optimal pacing strategies that we all, certain rules you cannot get away with breaking. Like, you shouldn't sprint the first mile of a marathon. But there is room for individuality as well. And, like, you know, for example, um, you know, it's funny because uh, uh, Kipchoge just you know broke the world record of the marathon with a positive split, um, mm. but he was clearly run going for two hours. Mm. Um, I would submit he actually would have finished faster with an even split, um, but you know, yeah. can't blame him for trying. But the the his previous record was a slight negative split split, and that is more the norm for for you know world class uh, marathoners. They they tend to. Um, achieve their best performances uh, with a very even to slightly negative split. Now, if you look at extreme ultramarathon distances, even you know the the winners and record breakers are slowing down almost always in, in you know uh, 100 k's, 100 milers. You know, even when they've done, they're covering that distance faster than any human ever has before, they are typically positive splits, and that's because you're just getting up to the the limits of human endurance, you know, like the, the marathon just isn't as long as it used to be for, for the elites. It's, it's over with pretty quick. It, it's a real race, but you know, the extreme distances, you're not just up against your limits, you're up against human limits. Well, a marathon really is an ultra for, for a back of the pack runner, you know, where it's, you know, it's, you know, it's taking them four, four plus hours to finish it. So, you sort of have to look at the rules like, well, if the elites are slowing down in ultras inexorably when they have their best race, maybe it is actually just, you know, kind of unavoidable. <laughs> you know, even if you, you if you, you know, train well and, and pace well, maybe if you're just, you know, if you're a slower runner, um, you, you probably should count on slowing down a little bit. Now, there are counterexamples, and I'm not really sure about that. I'm just saying it, 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 it is likely the case. For someone like you, you know, experienced runner, you know, up that up at that three hour mark, um, you know, if I were your coach, uh, I would I would train you for a, an even to negative split. I, I would not bank time and the you know, depending like the, the particulars of the course and, and the weather and, and such. Um, but I'm inclined to think. Uh, you know, not to degree, disagree with a previous guest, but I, that's the best way to say it. If I were your coach, I, I would train you for an even to, to negative split. No, that's good to hear. That's what I wanted to hear. So I'm pretty encouraged by that. Right on. The course is flat and cool because we are trying to give ourselves every yeah. piece of advantage. Mm-hmm. I'm into this now. When's the race? October 16th. Okay. Toronto. It's Toronto. Yep. Toronto okay, right Waterfront on. Marathon. Awesome. Uh, okay. Well, you promise to let me know how it goes. <laughs> yeah. We're, uh, we'll, we'll let the internet know. So you'll see. It. Yeah. Yeah. We're in the last three weeks. But we can definitely send you an email too, because, you know, afterwards uh, we'll be on break. So like we won't have anything better to do. <laughs> yeah, we'll, <laughs> like run. we'll have all these damn runs to do. So we'll... <laughs> 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 we're at the point now where it's occupying our every waking thought, basically. Yeah, and also the training yep. is occupying all of our free time. So yes. um, <laughs> that reminds yes. me, I need to talk to you when we finish. If you haven't done your run okay. today yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I guess we can talk about macro pacing. Uh, I mean, I hadn't heard that term before, but once you explain that, it's just basically pacing your basically your life as an athlete, or for elites, it's like pacing their career. 
as an yep. athlete, you dedicated a whole chapter to this. Why is macro pacing so important? Um, yeah, you know, I, 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 uh, I start that chapter with the exa example of um, Abdi Abi Rahman, uh, a, a American runner who qualified for five Olympics in various distance running events. Amazing. Yeah, most recently um, for the 2020, to uh, 2020 uh, Tokyo Olympics qualified in the marathon at 43. And so, I mean, that's inspiring, right? It, you know, like, you know, it's, it, I mean, it, it's a beautiful thing to, it, it's a beautiful thing to achieve your absolute pinnacle of your potential as a runner, but it's even better to get there and sustain it, <laughs> you know, not to just like have one great day that you're forever proud of, but to, mm -hmm. to have, you know, sustained excellence, you know, relative to, to your standards, um, you know, that's even better. Um, and it's possible. And the Abdi or Abdi Rahmans of, of the world prove it. And if you, if you look at what the, you know, cause he's not the only one, if you look at these runners and what they have in common, they're doing some of the, Sarah, Sarah Hall, Hall is my yeah. current inspiration. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mentioned her as well uh, in, in that same chapter. And, and so there's sort of a formula there and, you know, and that's what that chapter is about. So it's, it's like, Hey, if you, if you want to not just get to the top of your potential, but stay there for a while and have a number of performances that you're really proud of, then, you know, take a cue from the Abdi's and, and, and the Sarah Hall's. All, all of this kind of stuff. If you approach it with a certain mindset, could be you know quite stressful and, and hard work for some people. One of the things that Abdi says in his five things to focus on right at the end is stay in love with running. Um, and one of the things that you say at the end of your book is don't forget to have fun. Yes. So having focused on all these things and got stressful about our race coming up, et cetera, et cetera. Any advice on how we don't forget to have fun and stay in love? Yes. Um, you know, it starts with actually giving your, well, it starts with a, just recognizing that it's not a choice between running your best or having fun. You'll run your best when you're having the most fun. So uh, you know, it's easy for us to, to sort of, you know, separate those two things. And when we're competitive to get focused on the performance and sometimes it, it, it's at the expense of, of enjoying ourselves and staying in, in love with the sport. But it's really important. Like, Hey, if you care about performance, well, that's not going to stop. Don't worry about that. You can just count on that and actually focus on the fun part and give yourself permission to do things your way, you know, in terms of like, you know, where you run, when you run, how you run, who you run with, you know, that like just it's, you have the right <laughs> and you have, the, have the power. Um, there are lots of different ways, um, to go about the, this running thing. And, and you should, and, and part of it is also, you know, part of Abdi's formula for staying in love is actually balance. And you see that with, you know, the, the Sarah Halls and others too, masters of macro pacing is like, they take breaks. They have other thing priorities in their, in their lives that um, you would think, oh, that's stealing time and energy from running. No, you know, it's just like, it, it, it all ends up feeding right back into it because, you know, it's like, running is not your be all end all, you know, you can have a bad run, but a great day with your family or a great day, you know, at a job you love. And that actually reinvigorates you for the running. You're still a happy person, even when you have a bad run and in the long term, that, uh, that, that is, that is good for your running. So then um, just for the people, because I know, you know, like we're part of a, a, a club that's maybe a little more um, recreational. I mean, not that people don't want to run well, but uh but you know, we're not, uh, like we're not going to the Olympic trials or anything. And so sometimes what'll happen is, uh, you know, we'll have, we'll have completed marathon weekend and, um, maybe like Monday, there won't be any practice. And then, you know, by Wednesday, people are like, Oh, you coming for a run. <laughs> and then Saturday is like, Oh, you coming for the long run. <laughs> <laughs> and um, they don't really tend to take a lot of breaks after after like a, a big event. Sometimes they just, you know, they just keep on training. And it's not like I know sometimes you can keep on training because you have like other races coming, which is OK. But sometimes there aren't other races coming. So what kind of like what would you say to to the people that maybe don't see any value in taking a break because they're because they're not, you know, um, uh, trying Surprise. out for the Olympics or anything? 
Yeah, and I'm, you know, even there, like you know, there, there's there's room for doing it your way. You know, for for me, uh, you know, I, I used to get injured a lot, so my breaks were not by choice, and and some of them, some of them were years long. You know, I, I had uh, some chronic injuries that prevented me, excuse me, um, from competing for for one of them three and a half years of my absolute prime. I lost with a uh, wow. um, chronic case of, of runner's knee. So oh when I was healthy, I was hungry. <laughs> and, and so for me, like I would finish a marathon, take two days off and I'd be back at it. And it wasn't a bad decision for me, you know, because like I had to make hay when the sun sh shone. So, <laughs> you know, the motivation was there, you know, e even there, you know, you know, I, I spent the summer of uh, 2017 training with a team of professional runners in Flagstaff and, you know, they're just training so hard that when they finish like a, a season, the, you know, these people love running as much as anyone. I mean, it's, it's literally their job, but like the last thing they wanted to do was put on running shoes and like they would take two full weeks off. They would take enough time off that they actually started to miss it again. And then they knew okay. they were ready to start training again. So, you, you know, you, you, you kind of have, I mean, you have to, you have to pay attention to the physical side of it. Like you need a chance to recover and and recharge and stuff, but it's also okay to just sort of let your preferences guide you to, to a little bit. You know, if, you, if if you're hungry and motivated and you're having fun and you want to get back on the horse, you know, relatively quickly, that's all right. So basically, if you're staying motivated, then it, it's not really that much of a problem. Yeah, yeah. As long as you, you know, you're just being mindful of the physical side, you know, not in denial that you're just depleting yourself <laughs> by trying to stay in peak shape, you know, 12 months a year. Um, but yes, absolutely. At the back of the book, there's a there's a wealth of training plans. You know, there are four distances and four plans for each distance. Yeah, well, well, do you know what the collective noun is for training plans? You've got you've got a whole bunch of them there. Is it a portfolio of training plans? Or? A suite. A suite. A what? Of a suite. Oh, a suite. That sounds that's, good. Yes. That's rather nice. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's much better than a punishment of training plans. Or... <laughs> <laughs> A purgatory of training <laughs> plans at the back. <laughs> maybe there's probably no real word. We could we could maybe make an application for the word. So there's a, a lot of training plans at the back, um, which is great. And I, I spent uh, a bit of time kind of perusing that, looking for different things. I noticed, and obviously because it's a pace book, and we talk about um, you know, relative perceived effort that a lot of the indications are for so many minutes at perceived effort, et cetera. A couple of things that I, that I, that I noticed that I had questions about all the plans have four levels and all the levels start at level zero. How motivating yep. is that to be a, yeah. oh, I'm, a I'm a level zero. <laughs> it's meant yeah. to not be intimidating. That's right. Yes. And uh, yeah, you know, I forget who, cause I, you know, much earlier in my career, I, I always started all my plans at level one. Um, and then I forget who it was. Someone advised me, you know, you should do a level zero because, you know, there, there are some absolute, like absolute beginners out there who are, you know, very easily intimidated um, by, you know, you know, training that just seems daunting or, or not doable. Okay. And, and that, that person recommended that I, I create zero because that, that was my instinct. It was like, you know, that's like a put down. Like yeah. you're, you're, you're back yeah. back in the class for you, but but I, I I was assured that it was actually more welcoming, so that's why I do it. So. Okay, you know, I thought that was unusual. That's all. I thought I'd just mm -hmm. yes. ask you about that. Um, something that I noticed in the plans, I think it first comes into the plans at the 10k um, level is somewhere in the training program. There's a workout called the prefontaine what what's this the the prefontaine workout i suspect it's going to hurt <laughs> uh, or the, otherwise it wouldn't be called the prefontaine but what, what's the what is it and what's the idea of it so the original steve prefontaine uh workout was um you have to make adjustments if you're not steve prefontaine <laughs> 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 Yeah, he but, was known um, for fading from the front, I think, right? Yeah. Um, but he, you know, he, he, uh, so you're, you're running uh, short segments and you're toggling between your mile race pace and 10 seconds per 100 meters slower than that. 
Now, um, for Prefontaine, he was a four minute miler. So if you're not Steve Prefontaine, that's how you should think of it. It's your four minute time trial pace, uh, like whatever. So it's gonna be less than a mile for almost everybody, uh, but maybe not a, a, a lot less uh, for, some, for some people. And you just keep going. Prefontaine would uh, try to do it for 5K, but um, you know, like if if you want the the full experience, you go until you can no longer sustain those uh, paces. So you're going to failure, um, uh, which is fun. Like, <laughs> yeah, that's uh, yeah, that's that doesn't sound fun. Although um, I did get to try something like that because I was um, I was training. Uh, with another club in the winter because uh they had they had like indoor track once a week and uh that was uh, one of the one of the workouts it was like your 1600 meter pace alternated with something along the lines of a little bit slower but really not that much slower so you're not really recovering it's still like kind of fast (laughs) yep and you just keep going. There was no like end. And I found that really hard to not have like a goal, like a finish yep. line. <laughs> yeah. So, but yeah. The idea is it builds toughness and it, it helps you yes. to enjoy all the other training programs that are not that. I definitely enjoy everything that's not that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's an acquired taste. Okay. That, that's, that's interesting. I, I think you, you, you only have one of those in the, in any one plan. So. It's not like you're thrashing us all. No, no. All the time. Yeah, you got to be, you got to choose your moments to yeah. go yeah. that deep into the well. You can handle one of every, anything. Mostly your, mostly your training advice is, is in minutes, minutes at relative perceived effort. Yep. Um, but I noticed in marathons, all the long runs are in, in distance. Yep. I guess because you've got to run a marathon. So yes. you, you've got to cover a certain amount of distance. You could maybe confirm to me that that's the case. How come you have them in kilometers, but you're an American, you should have them in miles, shouldn't you? Yes. Um, you know, it, a lot of this comes from, including the level zero plans from my website, my business website, 8020endurance.com. So, the, you know, the training plans on there, um, the lowest level is is level zero for, for all of them. Um, and then, uh, you know, I think I would, have to get have, have my business partner here to confirm it but uh last i knew like about 60 percent of our athletes were outside the u.s um so you know by going by the numbers more more of our athletes are on the metric system and you know every american almost every american runner is pretty comfortable with with metric measurements so yeah. that is the reason well we love it here in canada so it's fine yeah that way we don't have to convert I guess I guess I will I will ask about 8020 publishing. Um, so this on pace is the first book that you're publishing. Uh, do you do you have anything else in the pipeline? I don't know if you want to talk about it because maybe you can't talk about it. But do you have other authors that are going to publish with you? Um, I can talk about it. I'm I'm happy to. And thank you for asking. As a matter of fact, uh, so. Yeah, we're, we are imminently going to release our second title, which is actually simply it's um, it's actually a, a book for coaches. Um, so my company is uh, we're creating our own coaching certification, um, you know, oh, so wow. so it's for, and it's for not just running coaches, but all endurance disciplines, because we, we cover uh, cycling, obstacle racing, triathlon, duathlon, aquathon, uh, you name it. Um, and, uh, and so uh, I, I, you know, just being who I am, like, you know, there's going to be an online course, which is really how it's done these days. But I thought, hey, I'm going to write an entire textbook to go, to go along with it. So that, <laughs> that will be our second release and it will be out uh, be- before the end of the year. And then I'm doing, I'm, I'm co-authoring one called Pain and Performance with a Flagstaff-based uh, strength and conditioning coach who's kind of like a pain whisperer for athletes. And it's uh, just a fascinating, I'll enjoy, or he will enjoy, because he's the lead author. He's the expert. I'm just the, the wordsmith. Um, uh, but it's like a deep dive into uh, the mind-blowing uh, kind of new science of, of pain and all the stuff that we thought we knew about it that, that isn't true. And, and really just like, it's, it's like um, the practical side is it, it's like how to self-manage pain and injury, like uh, as an athlete. Um, and then I'm working on another one that will be sort of a, little bit in the spirit of how bad you want it. I don't know if I'm allowed to use 
four letter words on this on this program, but uh, the, the title of that one is Screw Loose, Shit Together, A Theory of Athletic Greatness. Um, that'll be out sometime next year. And yeah, uh, eventually we will publish books by people other than me, but uh, I, you know me, I'm prolific and, and that's the main reason I created my own publishing company. Because <laughs> <laughs> you have too many ideas. <laughs> yes. Sounds great. And it sounds like you're going to keep our podcast in business as well. Yeah, that's definitely. my main motivation. <laughs> <laughs> something that i noticed about the book is at the front uh you have a dedication to bob cat kitty pathic roger and Susanna. i'm going to try to guess that these are people who you coach um you are correct maybe you could tell me about the dedication yes um yeah you know because um i i quite honestly i could not have written this book without um, the athletes I, I coach uh, one on one who um, each in their own way have allowed me to use them as guinea pigs. Um, you know, because you know, uh, you know, I've I've relied a lot on science, you know, to you know to just develop you know my method for teaching pacing. And I've also relied a lot on what I what I observe from elite athletes, and you've heard me make many references to both science and elite athletes. But I also uh, am a coach myself, and I I have my own thoughts about you know I, I'm you know I, I feel capable of coming up with things and seeing if if they work, and so my athletes allowed me to do that with them, um, and uh, and so they really deserved to have this one dedicated to them for that reason. That's so nice. I think I feel like every coach um, kind of does that with their athletes. You yes, know? they do. And, One and way or another. You, yes. Yeah, and and when you're like being coached, it's because well, you're a bit looking for that, I guess, because like otherwise you would just do the same thing all the time. And yes. So, um, where can people get a copy of the book? What's the best place or your preferred place? Yeah, the best place to go is. Um, the publishing company website, which is uh, 8020books.com. So 8020books.com. And you'll see it there front and center. And then from there, there are links to other places you can buy it. Um, we don't have an audio format yet. There are, we're, we're working on that, but we have uh, print and digital. And where can people follow you? Other than uh, other than the, all the places that we mentioned, we did mention your your website and um, eighty twenty publishing, obviously for all the new books coming out. Yeah, um, social media. I'm uh, I'm on. I'm not as active as I used to be, but uh, uh, Twitter at Matt Fit Writer um, and Instagram is Fitzgerald Matt. Good stuff. And uh, if you if you permit me, I know you you've had a, a big battle with um, long haul COVID. Um, how's that going for you at the moment? Uh, yep, still battling it. You know, I think I'm making a kind of progress that is not recovery, uh, but just like yeah. like living with it, managing it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, for me, I, I always I have more control over <laughs> above the neck, yeah. and I'm mm -hmm. just I'm just trying to be as happy as I can be. You know, given. Yeah. The, the fact that my health, um, yeah, and I'm definitely doing better in that regard. I'm like, I'm learning uh, how to live with it, but you know, like it's still there. So you've just kicked mm. your, your, you've just kicked yourself mentally into a different phase um, yep. rather than, rather than be looking to become the mat that you were uh, running the dream in 2017. Yes. Yeah. I don't, I don't, you know, I, I still, still walk and just a little bit of weightlifting and, um, you know, it's just, my body reminds me in all kinds of ways, like, don't do any more than this <laughs> for, no. for now. Like for yeah. now. Yes. Well, it goes without saying that we wish you all the best with, uh, with that. And, you know, you get the best outcome you could possibly, uh, hope for. I appreciate it. Well, you know, here's what you can do for me. If you, if you want to help, um, is, Tell me how your three-hour marathon attempt goes. <laughs> <'Cause> like, <laughs> okay, you, definitely. I, I, I'm serious. Like, we'll you know, because I I can't do it, and so like I really get invested. You can live in, vicariously through us. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So like, I genuinely really care, and uh, I hope you guys do it. I hope you have a great experience. For sure, we will. For sure, we will. You know, we 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 do a good job of I think of embracing the training and loving the training. Um, and so we go through the training, getting more and more excited. And we did it last year and we didn't achieve the run and it didn't put us off really. We said, right. wow, that was a great process. Yep. Are we going to have another go? Yes. Let's, let's wait, yeah. but let's wait a for full year. For sure. The, yeah. for sure the, full year. <laughs> yeah. the week before is like, then you're really nervous, but uh, 
we're still far enough that we're kind of like we're still zen we're okay <laughs> so let's give our uh, let's give our thoughts on just our, our potted thoughts on the book that we do at the end of every podcast and uh, then we'll thank maybe thank matt and let him get on with it okay running his multitude business is becoming a running mogul endurance empire me first go ahead um well the beauty of running is that there's always something that you can do or try and matt gives us some additional food for thought in this book i guess when you and i liz ran toronto in 2015 we ran in three hours 10 minutes we did a completely even split and finished with i think nothing in the tank we were running desperately with nothing in the tank just to get an even split that was seven years ago and i need to get back there and and i think this book rather than well the sort of magic happened for us and uh i'm saying oh i hope we can make the magic happen no it's not magic it's there's a recipe um we just don't know the whole recipe but i think this book's going to show us how to either create bake the cake, create some a cake with better ingredients or, or create the magic. So some of it's common sense, I think, but so often we see that common sense is not common practice. When we try to practice our pacing, we find that we don't have uh, enough innate sense. So there's a lot to be gained by just reading the book and t- taking the pieces that work for you. It's an easy read and it's well laid out. And there are some fun exercises um, which can make training interesting and fresh all over again so you know it's great from that point of view i guess i'll echo some of that um i thought this book was an eye-opener i think for novices and experienced runners alike Uh, i think especially for anyone that has only really started running in recent years and has never really experienced going on a run without a device to calculate their distance and their time maybe sometimes they don't realize how important uh, pacing by feel really is but uh, uh, after reading this book well you'll you'll just know Uh, the book uh, like Alan said is easy to read and there's a lot of side stories which is always the case with Matt's books so he always gives examples uh, from people he's coached or elite athletes to you know along with the science so it's um it's a great read and in that respect. Uh, if you're looking for a training plan that will help you make uh, make yourself less reliant on your GPS, then uh, the book does have training plans as well. So for 5k, 10k, half marathon and marathon distances. And uh, there are, like we said, four levels, which, uh, which is great because, you know, there's pretty much something for everyone in the training plans. I like the cover of the book, which is a picture of 2018 Boston Marathon winner. Here, I'm going to massacre it again, Yuki Kawachi. Um, So that year was, I don't know, for those people that don't know, I mean, Alan ran it that year. That year was the coldest, rainiest marathon, Boston Marathon ever. Uh, People were dropping out with hypothermia. And, um, and yeah, you see this picture of Yuki on his way to the win in his singlet with his arm warmers and, um, (laughs) just, you know, it just like the, the expression on his face is just pure pain. So, um, it's, uh, yeah, definitely a great example of mental toughness, the ability to get as much out of yourself as you can. And I mean, I think that's what we all kind of want for ourselves. So good choice for cover photo thank you thanks once again matt for your for your book and your time we look forward to uh talking to you again soon with respect to your next your next uh adventure right on always a pleasure to talk to you guys and our our marathon results will be uh, yep will be in your inbox yes (laughs) better be (laughs) Uh, well enjoy uh enjoy these last three weeks um i mean it's this is this is what we live for, you know. I like I, I would, I would give an eye to trade places with you. So don't forget that. Like it's a, it's really okay. a gift and an opportunity to be able to do what you're doing. Yeah, and you definitely can't sacrifice an eye because you have to keep writing those books. So okay, <laughs> right. Maybe I'll put that into my mantra list. Last few k, Matt would mm-hmm. trade places with me. Don't give yes. it up now. Matt would trade places with me. Yeah. Yes. So, there yeah. you go. Homage. Thank you for listening to another episode of Running Book Reviews. Big thank you to the publisher, 8020 Publishing, for providing a review copy of the book and uh, to Matt for spending time with us today. 
If you'd like to leave us feedback about how we can improve the podcast or want to suggest a book that you'd like for us to review in a future episode, please leave us a comment on social media. We are running book reviews on Facebook and Instagram and on Twitter, we are reviews underscore running. Please also follow us on social media to find out when new episodes are released, or you can just subscribe to the podcast on your favorite streaming platform. If you've been listening for a while and are wondering how you can help us out, there are a few other ways. If you're enjoying the podcast, spread the word, tell your friends about us, or share a link to your favorite episode with a running partner. Leave us a review on Apple Podcasts if this is how you listen to your podcast. You can also rate us on Spotify out of five stars. We prefer five stars, but if you want to give us one star, that's okay. But, you know, maybe you can let us know why we didn't earn five. Um, You'd have to leave that on social media, I guess. (laughs) We are also now on Buy Me a Coffee, where you can buy us a coffee. Or you can just go there to listen to some little extras. No purchase required. Bye for now. Bye. Bye.